So I want to go over a little bit about um, uh, the different materials that can be used for thinning. And I'd have to say this is one of the more um, frustrating aspects of, of doing all this work. I really enjoy the physiology and, and learning about pollen tube growth. Um, when we get out and trying to use this in the field, we've come across a number of barriers for implementation uh, related to different labels. And that's because um, chemical companies are uh, concerned about um, their products being used in such a way that either causes over thinning, causes damage to the fruit. Um, it's just uh, sometimes outside of, of their comfort zone or what they feel that their products were designed to do. Um, however, many of these uh, products um, that are available, um, the way they work for flower thinning tends to be because they're caustic. They're causing some sort of burning on the plant tissue itself. And so when that happens, um, you can cause uh, damage to foliage, but if you damage the fruit surface, especially you damage it right at the point of, uh, of king bloom opening um, to petal fall, there isn't, um, the, fl the fruit has not developed a very thick uh, epicuticular wax yet. And so damage is um, more likely to happen then than even using these products um, two or three weeks later. So uh, this slide here is a list of some of the different products that are available. I would say lime sulfur is the most commonly used flower thinner. Um, it is often used uh, with an oil in Washington state where conditions tend to be um, lower humidity conditions tend to be what they have during bloom. They tend to have less russeting. So sometimes they'll use up to a 5% lime sulfur solution without an oil. Uh, we found in our work that uh, lower rates of lime, soil, of lime sulfur with an oil is recommended for um, minimizing the amount of fruit russeting that can happen. Uh, Ammonium thiosulfate, uh, ATS, it's a fertilizer. It's a nitrogen fertilizer. It's commonly used for both apple and peach thinning. It's again, caustic. Um, there's no specific label for thinning, um, but it is one that is commonly used as a fertilizer at the same time that you might be thinning. <laughs> and I'll probably say the same about lime sulfur. I'll, I have another slide where I'll go over some of the, the lime sulfur products that are available. Regalia, which is a um, biofungicide developed by and sold by Maroon Biosciences. It's a, um, effective for a number of different diseases, but Keith Yoder, as a pathologist, saw it in the trial and he saw that there was some petal burning and he said, hmm, uh, while that might be a negative to some people's mind, he was also working on the pollen to model for flower thinning and said, maybe this is something that has the potential to be used as a flower thinner. And so we've done a lot of work on this. Um, we found it um, uh, effective at a number of different rates. I'll show you that slide in a minute, but it's best used with an oil. When it's used without an oil, it tends to be less efficacious. And there has been some product formulation changes in the past couple years and um, we think that the newer formulation should work as well as the older formulation, but um, we haven't had an opportunity yet to test them side by side. Um, we found pretty minimal thinning results from both um, Maxell or 6BA, 6-benzaladenine and NAA. Um, the number of different company name brands are shown there. Um, neither of them you know, while these are really common thinners for 10 millimeter thinning, we did not find either of them to be particularly effective for flower thinning. Um, we did find some um, positive results uh, for NAD, which is the um, uh, kind of an analog compound. It's an oxen, it's very similar to NAA. It's an older material for petal fall thinning. And um, uh, for whatever reason with the specific chemistry differences between NAD and NAA, we found NAD to be a better thinner for flowers than NAA. And then various salts um, have been tried, um, potassium carbonate, um, sodium chloride, just, that's just table salt, have really been inconsistent in their, in their effects um, for flower thinning.
So um, since I mentioned that lime sulfur is really the most common flower thinner, I've tried to get in touch with um, a number of the different manufacturers because it's always been, there's always been label restrictions that have made it difficult to recommend using lime sulfur for flower thinning, even though we know it can be efficacious, it can be used safely if the proper precautions and knowledge are in place. But um, again, some chemical companies, uh, Miller in particular, which is available and registered in New York State, specifically says on their label to not use the product for crop thinning. And they also have other comments in there about not using it with oil. Um, and uh, so they recommend its use um, for, uh, as a fungicide, a pink and a petal fall, but they do not at this time recommend it for crop thinning. Uh, Brandt is um, also um, uh, potentially interested in getting a label in New York, but there is not one available yet, and they have very specific guidance to not use it with an oil, um, which I think would be a mistake in New York State. Nova Source uh, has the most specific language related to bloom thinning, and they their label allows for its use in Idaho and North Carolina, Oregon, Pennsylvania, Utah, Virginia, and Washington, but unfortunately not New York. Um, they are seeking registration for New York. Uh, it's held up at the EPA right now, um, and they, you know, with everything that's happening, it's most likely not to get approval in time for 2020. Hopefully, for 2021. Um, that will be the lime sulfur product that will most likely be available for us in New York. Um, and then Rex makes a product called Orcal. This is the most commonly used lime sulfur product in, in Washington state. They have a very specific label for Washington. They do not have product uh, registered in New York at this time, but they are looking into um, whether or not New York's a big enough market to go through that, um, that process. So, um, you know, just put on my extension hat here and just remind everybody to always um, check with your local regulatory bodies and extension offices to um, find out what products are available. Okay, so I'm gonna go through um, some, some slides now um, and talk a little, little bit about some of the results from some of our trials using the model. So this hey, one Greg, was... Oh, before go you go on, we do have a question coming in. Yeah, please. Um, Levi's asking, he says he believes he currently uses post-bloom thinners. What would you say are the main benefits uh, switching to blossom thinning or using both? Mm -hmm. So, um, and I talked about this a little bit earlier, um, but there's a number of reasons why you want to start thinning earlier, right? And so we talked about increasing fruit size, um, better return bloom, and less biennial bearing when you're doing bloom thinning. And I'll mention this in a little bit too, but I really think that bloom thinning is a tool, it's a practice to be used in concert with a number of other crop load management tools. And so if you've been following the work um, by uh, Homologists in New York and Michigan and other places are talking about this precision crop load technique where you kind of whittle away at your crop load until you get to a very precise number of fruit per tree. And so that is done through pruning, it's done through blossom thinning, petal fall thinning, 10 millimeter thinning, uh, um, et cetera. And so this is another tool in the toolbox for you. Thanks, Greg. So, um, this froze up for a sec here. Okay. So, this is a project. We did this in um, 2013 on a Honeycrisp orchard in Virginia, larger trees, 111 rootstock. And um, here we, we were trying to do is to um, look at um, a number of different chemistries that can be used for bloom thinning. So, again, here's the model. We started it on. Um, uh, April uh, 23rd in the early morning, looks like somewhere around eight, nine o'clock in the morning. You can see here's the pollen tube growth rate, oopsie, <laughs> going up. Um, here's our black line here is our style length and the dotted line is our diurnal temperatures. Okay, and the first application went on 
on April 30th, and then a second application went on on um, lost the date there, but at some point later. And so here are the results. So again, this is kind of just a, hey, what, what kind of products can we use for blossom thinning? This is our check at the bottom. We had almost 10 fruit per branch cross-sectional area in the check, way too many. And you can see uh, many of these products, really not much efficacy, ABA, Ethafon, Pomaxa, which is a, um, an NA formulation, lime sulfur, you can see we're getting now, if you look at the letters, statistical letters, anything that it does not have an A is different than the control. So we get a reduction in thinning with Pomaxa, lime sulfur, and you can see uh, Maxell. And then um, this is lime sulfur by itself. And you can see here, again, I was recommending lime sulfur with oil, one of the most efficacious pro products. Um, Amethyst, it's it, that's the NAD product. Again, we're showing some good efficacy and ATS, very, very strong blossom thinner. This is a 10 millimeter check and this is kind of a hand thinned check. Uh, for a grower, you're probably on Honeycrisp wanting to get somewhere between four and six fruit. So some of these may have thinned too much, but again, this is a research trial, not necessarily for the grower um, with no additional thinning after the bloom thinning went on. This is a project we did on Golden Delicious. Again, we're looking at um, materials that can, different types of materials that can be used for thinning. This one we were looking specifically for organic materials, materials that can be used for organic orchards. Here's the model. Here's our diurnal temperatures, day, night, up and down, translating into the pollen tube growth rate. Our first thinning spray, we put it on shy of the style length, okay? So this was probably, um, uh, a little early in this experiment. And that was, you know, some years are like that based on the weather conditions. The next day it might've been predicted to rain and we knew that we couldn't get the material on. And so we decided to go ahead and put the, the spray on early. Sometimes you have to make these compromises. Um, in Washington state, there's less compromises because their weather tends to be more consistent. For us, we find these sorts of things happen a little bit more often. And then the second spray went on, um, again, less than the, the style length. And so let's look at the results. This is looking at a number of different materials. Um, we'll look at um, these three right here. This is regalia. This is the knotweed extract that I mentioned. We found it to be fairly rate insensitive. So two, four, and six quarts uh, per 100 gallons were all pretty much the same results. And they all reduced crop load relative to the control that had an A. These do not have A's, so they're statistically different than the control. Um, and then lime sulfur seems to numerically, at least maybe not statistically, but numerically reduced at these various different rates and different application methods, uh, crop load relative to regalia and certainly a lot less than the control. It's a project that we did looking at trying to combine different materials uh, in organic production for um, both crop load management and for disease management. And as I mentioned, a lot of the products that are used for bloom thinning have disease management aspects to them. And so we're seeing, one, can we uh, justify the use of them as, as fungicides or as disease control materials, but also can we get some, um, some double duty out of them? Can we both manage crop load and manage diseases with them? So that's just kind of the objective. Some of the diseases that we're concerned with, cedar apple rust, quince rust, quince rust, which affect apples during bloom. And then this is the experimental setup. So it's kind of a, a, a no treatment control. And then we had a, um, a lime sulfur at 10 millimeter, because that's an organic practice that some growers were using, a hand thinned control. And then we did um, these kind of, um, different combinations of lime sulfur and regalia, each time with an oil. So lime sulfur followed by lime sulfur, same timing, lime sulfur with regalia, 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 and then regalia and lime sulfur, okay? So all the applications went on the same time for the bloom thinning and all the applications for the first application and the second application. So again, here's our pollen tube growth rate. Here's our style length. We're just over the style length. That was a really good, um, Use of the model in this year, application two went on uh, maybe 
Um, could have let it go on a little bit longer, but again, specific weather conditions that year probably said, let's go ahead and, and do this now and not wait. And that's just kind of how you have to use this model. And then some of the results, um, you can see that they all reduced crop load relative the, to the control. Um, in our previous work, we'd found lime sulfur to be a stronger thinning agent than regalia. So we're kind of seeing about what happens if we can control, you know, a strong thinner with a weak, somewhat weaker thinner. Um, we found some numerical difference, but not statistical differences. They all have that letter B after the meaning that they're statistically equivalent to each other. Um, just looking at which flowers got fertilized, um, just for the sake of time, I won't go into all the details and nuance in this. I do want to discuss this slide, however, um, and say that uh, russeting can be an issue. And so this is uh, the x-axis here is percent of harvested fruit with russet. And you can see that it's considerable, right? Um, our hand thin, no, no russeting. And even lime sulfur at 10 millimeter, no russeting. But the applications that we did during bloom all had russeting to varying degrees. And what we think was that lime sulfur, particularly when it was the second spray, happened when it was quite humid out. And that lime sulfur application when it's humid out can cause a lot of russeting. So that's something to really keep in mind when you're using that product specifically for flower thinning. It's kind of what the uh, foliage and the petals on the flowers look like after these different um, applications. And you can see the, um, the bottom left, how, um, how much damage there was to the petals. And on the bottom right, this is lime sulfur at 10 millimeter, even though it caused minimal amounts of fruit russet, you can see how damaging it was to the foliage. And so again, right at when the, um, right at, at, at during flowering and, and up through petal fall, there's just a very thin layer of, of wax, of epicuticular wax to protect that fruit. And that's when these materials can be most damaging. And so we did find, and, and, and uh, uh, I'll provide these slides later, um, we'll go into all the nuanced detail here, but we did find efficacy for disease control from these products, as well as with, um, as thinning agents. So we were able to show some double duty there. And then um, just some additional trials. These are in New York and different product combinations. Again, um, what I want to show you here is that our temperatures in 2017 were quite cool all through the bloom period. And we had this really um, elongated time between starting the model and putting on our first thinner. We didn't even get to the green line, which is our style length in this picture. And um, I think it's one of the issues, you know, we did a lot of this work in Virginia. We showed its efficacy really well in Virginia, also in Washington state. As you move further north, one of the things we're finding is that colder temperatures during bloom really make it a lot more challenging to use this model. Um, and so there's going to be some years where it's going to um, not always work or not always work as well. And that's just something that we're learning and something to keep in mind. Um, uh, again, I won't go into all the details here, but what we're looking at is um, uh, crop load number of apples per, um, this is in uh, branch cross-sectional area, some work by Peter Herzeel, and finding some good efficacy again by regalia and lime sulfur. Just kind of what the picture looks like. A similar situation happened in um, 2018, cool weather during bloom, a little bit warmer, but it made it really challenging, um, again, to know when to start the model clock and when to um, put on the first application. And um, point out that, again, we found good results with both the use of lime sulfur and oil and regalia and oil as bloom thinners. Just kind of similar stuff there. So um, this slide here is just showing you some of the local resources of people who have been using the bloom thinning model in different parts of, of the country. 
some people that you might want to contact if you're outside of New York in terms of getting some assistance, getting some local input. Um, I've mentioned this already. There's a lot of nuance into you know where you're located in terms of the efficacy of these different products and also in terms of the pollen tube growth rates. And so just some concluding remarks here. Um, bloom thinning um, can be, and I think it should increasingly be used in the Eastern US. I've given you a lot of caveats as to when it does work, when it might not work as well. Um, I think really targeting uh, varieties where fruit size is an issue and thinning early, such as gala is important, and also thinning really biennial uh, varieties such as Fuji and Honeycrisp. 2020 is looking to be a really big year for Honeycrisp uh, bloom because last year was kind of off. And so I think it's um, something to look at for Honeycrisp blocks this year. Also, um, when they Honeycrisp, for example, blooms later, or when temperatures tend to be a little warmer, and that also makes the model work um, somewhat better. Uh, you may be able to reuse some of your fungicide sprays. Um, just lots of warnings about russeting can be an issue. It has to do more with the materials that you might select over the model. It's uh, how the model is uh, being implemented, but just something to keep in mind. And um, I mentioned this already, but making bloom thinning part of a whole model for, for crop load management on your farms. But I just want to put up an acknowledgement slide and thank um, various funding agencies and all the different technicians and grad students who have worked on this project over the years. There's been a lot of work that's gone on to this. It's been going on for 15 plus years now. Um, really a lot of this, again, was focused on Washington State, and we're really excited to see this work get uh, implemented in New York and other parts of the eastern U.S. So a little joke for you. If you're Morris and you have questions, um, now is a good time to ask them. So Greg, I do see a couple questions coming through. The first one is, does foliar nutrient program pre-bloom influence the rate of the pollen tube growth? Um, the, we haven't looked at that specifically. What we do know is um, certainly orchards with sufficient nitrogen content um, tend to have healthier bloom overall. Uh, we also know that some um, uh, nutrients such as boron and zinc can affect um, pollen tube growth. And if you have orchards that are deficient in those elements, that, that you should be looking to increase those levels to get them um, to uh, an adequate range. Great. And then we have another uh, two questions. How does ATS compare to the organic materials as far as russeting is concerned? Um, ATS can also cause russeting. Um, I would be, um, you know, so here, here's russeting is, is worse when you have high humidity. And the reason why high humidity is an issue is because you typically have slow drying times. And so the material tends to stick around on the surface for a long time. And um, so no matter whether you're using ATS, lime sulfur, et cetera, um, I would look at the humidity that, that's happening. And if it's really humid conditions to either back down on the rates or try to adjust your timing somewhat. You know, it's, it's a little tricky because as a physiologist, I'm thinking like, okay, let's get the timing just right based on the pollen tubes, but there's all these other factors that need to be considered uh, as a grower. Uh, would you recommend using the model for varieties that are not currently supported by NUA? Um, if so, you know, can you think of any substitutions or are there resources for which varieties you might be able to substitute in? So that's a really big challenge. And, and as I mentioned, the seven varieties that we have models for currently are really based on um, the varieties, you know, the predominant commercial varieties in Washington state. Um, we know we grow a lot more varieties. We have a lot more diversity in New York and other parts of New England. 
Um, at this time, I, I can't say, you know, specifically we don't have a replacement list. Um, it's something that we've actually put in a proposal to get some funding to do to either generate a model that can be used more universally or even try to come up with, um, I think as the, as the person who asked the question suggested is, you know, can we group can we, can we group varieties by like slow, medium, fast, and then figure out which models work best? And I, and I think, I think that's achievable, but we don't have that data currently. Sure. Then another question, um, what about lime sulfur regalia without oil? Maybe less effective for thinning, but maybe less russeting and better return bloom? Um, so a couple questions in there. Um, we, um, so to, to get enough thinning out of lime sulfur without oil, you're talking at starting at about three and a half percent, three and a half you know, gallons per hundred gallon tank, if you think about it that way, and going up to about five gallons per hundred gallon tank. Um, and um, I think you're gonna have a lot more russeting with that. I would rather see a grower reduce their lime sulfur rate down to 1% if they're concerned about russeting and leaving the oil somewhere between one and 2%. Um, the second part of that question is um, about return bloom. Return bloom is gonna be based on how, many, um, how much fruit you're removing from the tree early in the season. And so if you have poor thinning, you're probably not going to improve return bloom. So lime sulfur and or regalia is really the active component of that mix and the oil is just helping as a surfactant getting it into the tree. Great, thanks Greg. Um, any other questions for Greg? And Mike did offer that I would, I would answer questions about some of my other research activities around hard cider or soil health as well. I'm happy to answer those questions. And Dan's still on the line too if you have questions about NUA and I'm sure he'd be happy to answer any questions related to NUA. Greg, can you speak to the rates for ATS? Um, let me go back and see what we've tried. So do we have ATS in our trials? Um, I think it was way back here that we had an ATS in here. Yeah, so we were using uh, three and a half percent in this trial here. Um, I think you can get efficacy down uh, well below that, 2%. Um, but, you know, it's always, a, it's going to be a trade-off. And if conditions are humid or you have very, uh, you have varieties that you think are going to be prone to russeting, you may get less thinning activity, but also less russeting with these materials. And so you have to kind of, you have to balance those in your mind and, and, and consider your risk to reward scenario with this. Um, you know, none of them are perfect, but they, um, they have different applications in there that make them useful. Uh, we, we did find less russeting uh, with regalia um, over lime sulfur. So Greg, another question. Um, do you always want to dry as quickly as possible with ATS and lime sulfur and a follow-up um, temperature sensitivity with either those at certain temperatures? Yeah, okay. So the first question on humidity, lower humidity is gonna result in less russeting. And that's why, uh, that's why in Washington state, they tend to um, use higher rates than we can use in, in New York State or in Virginia and get and get by without russeting is because of lower humidity. So again, lower rates with oil is better than a higher rate by itself. And and remind me, I got distracted by my dog. What was the second part of that question, Mike? Oh, temperatures. Um, high temperature temperatures, sensitivity. Yes. So I would avoid using these materials above 90 degrees Fahrenheit. Not happen does not happen too often during bloom for us um, in this part of the country but um, things are changing, climate is changing rapidly. Um, and anything below um, 75 degrees, you tend to start losing some efficacy, efficacy from these materials. 
Um, I'd say once you're below 70, it's probably not worth it. Okay. Um, from Chris, we used ATS at 2%, but without oil and had medium efficacy. Um, would you consider adding oil to ATS or not? Hmm. I can't speak specifically to that. I have not tried ATS with oil, and I do not know what that combination would be like. Uh, so <laughs> Dan screams no, I'm not sure <laughs> which Dan that is, but somebody's screaming no. Uh, Dan Olson. <laughs> <laughs> Dan, Dan says no. Okay. So, Greg, just to confirm, you said these materials will not work below 70 degrees? Uh, let, me, let me say, let me, maybe I should not have said it that way. That might have been a little stronger. You lose efficacy when you go down below 70, and you're probably, um, so in some of our work, we've put this on. I can show you here. Um, we can look at this exactly. Our temperatures here were in the high 50s, and we still had good control. So I don't know. I might retract that comment um, and, and say that's something I have in my mind. But in, in truth, if we look at this one, where were we at when we put on our thinning application? Um, again, in the 70s, I mean the high 50s. And then here, why is this flipping like this? Here, our application was, again, probably uh, what, 12, four, 12, 13 degrees Celsius. It's all flipping around here, which is, uh, again, in the low 60s. So um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, to um, pull back on that comment about 70 degrees okay. <laughs> and say, yeah, we've done it at cooler temperatures. Um, you're going to increase your efficacy as you get around 70 and that would maybe i should say that as being more of an ideal temperature to target but all as right. i show with the timing you can't you can't always get all these things to come together in our climate to, at the same time all right so application at night is probably not a good idea you want to do it in the warm part of the day yeah i would say so now with that in balance with the fact that you're putting on chemicals during bloom when bees are flying and bees are going to be more active during the day. So yeah. things to consider and, and kind of think through. Yep. So Greg, uh, when would you normally apply? What time of day? So when we've done our work, we've, we've based it on the model as close as we can. Um, we adjust according to specific temperature conditions and looking forward at when it's going to rain, what the wind conditions are going to be like. For growers with a larger acreage, you're going to be looking at, um, you know, how do you cover enough territory in a certain amount of time. And... Um, you know, I think you have to find that ideal spray window. We know that spray windows tend to be pretty short and rare in the springtime as well. Just the temperature tends to be more variable. Um, so we, you know, those are just some of the caveats that we've kind of worked with. I think from a modeling perspective, you're trying to get the pollen tube growth rate or pollen tube length to be longer than the style. Mm -hmm. um, and usually thinking, I would think about it as, um, you know, if you're between 90 and 110% of your style length, that's a good target. All right. Any other questions on bloom thinning for Greg? Please keep typing them in. And I'm looking in the comment box. It was Dan Donahue who said no to ATS with oil. <laughs> And so I guess he, and he's screaming no and, and laughing. And so I, I am guessing that is a, a, something that he is saying is, is a very bad idea. So with that, um, I'd like to thank Greg and Dan for joining us today. Um, if you have any more questions on bloom thinning or um, on any of Greg's other research, whether it be hard cider, sustainable organic production, please stick around. We'd be happy to, to, field those questions from you. So Greg, I do have a question for you on the cider varieties. 
Oh, okay. Um, just asking in general, what kind of research you've done on hard cider varieties? Um, okay. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a big question. And, and so I will, um, let me just get a quick link up here. Yeah. So in terms of hard cider, I put a link up in the chat box to our Cornell website for hard cider. And we've really looked at it from a number of different perspectives. Um, cost of production, what varieties we should be growing for hard cider, um, how to grow them in terms of crop load management, in terms of harvesting. Um, a lot of our focus is on uh, attributes, chemical attributes that are specific to cider varieties. So things such as the phenolics or the tannins in um, that are in apples, as well as you know acidity, sugar levels, um, unusual sugar such as sorbitol, the sugar alcohol that's in a lot of rosaceae plants. Um, those are things that are interesting to cider producers. Greg, what's your experience with the Franklin cider apple? None. Um, okay. uh, I've heard a lot about it. It is, um, there was a single variety, a single tree found in a hedgerow in um, northern Vermont. Right. Uh, the guy who found it um, started promoting it. He's uh, kind of a, um, he talked it up a lot, got Stark Brothers interested in it. They filed for some legal protection on it and have been promoting it as the next best thing. I believe it to be um, a, um, either a, you know, it's, it's some sort of hybrid crab apple. I'm not sure what the parentage is or percentage is. Um, the little bits I've heard about it on the plus side are that it's um, fairly annual it um, has very high levels of tannins and acidity, just like a lot of crab apples do. Yep. Um, but on the negative side is um, I've seen an orchard in New York State that was ravaged with fire blight, um, a Franklin cider apple with a lot of fire blight. So I would not believe the promotions that it is completely disease resistant at all, or that it could be used in a no spray situation. Okay. Um, we we have we had another question. Trees. Oh, go ahead. I was just follow up. We have some three year old trees we harvested fruit off from last fall over the Franklin, and we found the apple to be a little overpowering in in the cider blends. Um, and I don't know if you've gotten any response from more experienced cider makers on whether it's too powerful with tannins and acidity. So I would. As I mentioned, it, it's very similar. It is probably in all likelihood a, a crab apple of some sort. And so I would say it'd be very similar to using, you know, any other crab apple in your blend. And you'd find that um, the specific uh, phenolic compounds in, in, in a lot of crab apples tend to be um, very strong, but that, you know, in, in a small percentage of an overall blend, it can add some um, good mouthfeel and some you know structure. add some things yeah. to it. But if 100% crab apple cider is often very difficult to drink. Yeah, <laughs> personally, I find it very challenging. It's, it's it can be a very uh, abrasive or bracing, I should say. Right. Okay. Thank you, Greg. We had another follow up on thinning. Um, applying ATS or lime sulfur best practices for bees in the orchard. Um, and also with the oil, is that damaging to the bees as they're pollinating? Um, so I, I, I don't have specific information on this. Um, what I would say is we need to just be really cautious about any application that happens during bloom uh, with everything happening around colony collapse disorder. Uh, um, that doesn't mean no thinning, but it does mean um, just being aware of the issues. I don't know if uh, if you, Mike, or uh, if Dan Donahue's still on the call, have any experience or comments about um, these materials during bloom in terms of bee health. I'm not too familiar with the bee health side of things. I do know that as far as the application timing, uh, certainly there's that trade-off of trying to hit right at that sweet spot of 100 to 110%. Um, 
and then the question of what do you do when that 100% happens to fall at 11 p.m. Um, so certainly in the trials that we've done, we've been trying to hit that that 100%, uh, but certainly I, th I think it's a compromise there. Yeah. So if you can come. I have no experience with, uh, with you know, effects on bees. I echo Mike's comment that the challenge is the weather in implementing the model. And yeah, I, I, I agree with that. And I've made that comment a few times already. I will say um, there's some work coming out of Virginia Tech, which I hope will get published in the next um, year or so, where they looked at, you know, the, if you start spraying at 70, then 80, then 90, then 100% and so on um, of the style length, like how big of an effect, you know, using the same spray chemicals, how big of an effect does it have on the final fruit set? And so there is some work looking into how much leeway do you have around that 100%? And I think that'll be really valuable once we have that data. Great, thank you, Greg. Um, any final questions for Greg before we, we hop off? All right, I guess not. Um, well, again, I thank you all for joining us today. Um, again, we have Greg's and Dan's contacts up here. Thanks to you both for joining us again. Uh, feel free to reach out to Greg at his email, or you can get in touch with Dan Olmsted at the new uh, support desk email. And certainly if you're in Eastern New York, feel free to reach out to me if you're from the Northern half of the region or Dan Donahue, if you're in the Hudson Valley, if you have any questions on any of this. All right, thanks a lot, everybody. Thanks again, Thank you, Mike. Mike. Thank you. Andrew and Dan.